Welcome to video two of our probability unit. Uh, in this video, we are actually going to start talking about some uh, fundamentals and some actual calculations involving probability, but still, for the most part, basic probability. So first off, a probability model. We're going to be dealing with a lot of those this chapter, uh, and we'll even see some probability not models next chapter as well. Uh, so the definition of a probability model is that it is a mathematical description of a random phenomenon. Now, what might a random phenomenon be? I'll give you some examples here shortly. But a probability model is always split up into two parts. Uh, the first part we would call the sample space, and I'll talk about the, the formal definition of a sample space here in a second. Uh, but think of just a sample space as what are the possibilities that could happen here? What are the possible outcomes uh, that could result of this random phenomenon? And not only do we have outcomes, uh, but we also have probabilities associated with each of those individual outcomes. So sample space by definition is the set of all possible outcomes of a random phenomenon. And again, I'll give you some examples here in a second. So again, sample space, all of the possible outcomes of a random phenomenon. So here are some specific ones. So flipping a coin, what are all the different possible outcomes of flipping a standard coin? And we would say heads and tails, right? Now, do you have to say heads first and tails second? No, you could you know, switch the order uh, of these outcomes in any way possible. Now, typically, whenever you talk about outcomes, uh, usually you see these kind of like squiggle brackets used to denote set notation, if you will. Um, so there's nothing really special about using the squiggle brackets, but that is what is commonly used. So rolling a die, if we're talking a standard six-sided die, then your sample space would be rolling a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Uh, suit of a playing card. Uh, you could either get a club, a heart, a diamond, a spade. Again, order doesn't matter there. And if you rolled two six-sided dice, uh, and if we wanted to talk about the sum of the two dice that you rolled, well, the, the minimum scenario would be if you rolled snake eyes, right? If you rolled two ones and you added those together to get a two, uh, all the way up to if you rolled double sixes. If you added those together, the maximum value you're going to get is 12. But you could get any other sum between 2 and 12 uh, as a result of adding two dice together. Now, probability models are commonly set up as a table, like I have shown here, with the sample space in one row, typically it's the top row, uh, and the associated matching probabilities beneath each event. So you'll have some indication, like what does this sample space represent? Uh, and then you'll have, typically it'll say probabilities, or it may use a capital P uh, to describe probability as a shortcut. And then whatever your sample space uh, events are, whatever your outcomes are. You know, if this was like uh, rolling a six-sided die, then event A, you know, might be rolling a one. Event B might be rolling a two and a three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we could talk about the associated probabilities for rolling a 1 underneath it, and for rolling a 2 underneath it, and a 3 underneath it. So let me show you uh, an example of rolling that six-sided die. So you may just simply call this like number. This isn't hashtag. This isn't Twitter. Old people like myself know that the this is the pound symbol before it was the hashtag symbol. Uh, but this also represents number, right? So I'm representing the number symbol here to represent what number I could roll in my sample space. And then I have the probability, capital P, and then in parentheses of that particular value, of that number. So the probability of rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 is all the same probability. It's 1 sixth. Now this leads us to our two very basic probability model rules. And rule number one, this, is, this isn't Fight Club, uh, but rule number one of probability models is that each event's probability has to be between zero and one inclusively. And what I mean by inclusively is that technically a probability could equal zero. 
and technically a probability could equal one. Um, so we can't have any negative probabilities. You can't say you gave 110% because that is improbable of giving 110%. You can give 100%, but you can't give more than 100%. All right. So notice that each of our probabilities down here in rolling a die, they're all between 0 and 1, right? And they all happen to be the same value. The second probability rule is that the sum of all of the probabilities must add up to be 1. So if I took 1 sixth plus a sixth plus a sixth plus a sixth plus a sixth, all of these six sixths give me 1 or 100%. Okay, so those are our two basic probability rules. Probabilities are between 0 and 1 inclusively, and all of the probabilities must add to be 1 or 100%. So we're going to talk about this example called Binford's Law. Okay, and Binford's Law says uh, that in many naturally occurring collections of numbers, the leading significant digit is likely to be small. And you may not fully understand what that, uh, that means specifically, um, but as you get older, it may be when you start uh, an actual job, um, and I'll, I will say that the IRS uses Binford's Law to be able to detect if someone is uh, potentially cheating on their taxes. Uh, and what they can do is if they ask for account numbers, typically account numbers are going to begin with smaller numbers, like 1, because why would you start anywhere else besides, you know, with small numbers and work your way up to bigger numbers, right? And so what they find is if people make up certain numbers, um, they're usually going to be making up numbers across the board, 1 through 9. But anything that should be naturally occurring um, should, you know, naturally start off with smaller numbers like 1s and 2s. And you shouldn't run into bigger numbers like 7, 8, and 9s until, you know, the, the data set gets uh, significantly larger, right? So here's what Binford's Law, here's the probability uh, model, if you will. And I pulled this off of uh, Wikipedia. And so they gave me a table, but they drew it vertically instead of horizontally. So here is the probability model. And then they decided, hey, if you don't understand, you know, the differences between these percentages, we're going to make a, you know, a little bar graph here for you. So here is our sample space. So Binford's Law, and it, notice it doesn't include the number 0, so it's only the digits 1 through 9. And then each of those numbers, if it's the leading digit of an account, let's say, or of some number, uh, that 30, a little over 30% of the time, you're going to find that that particular number is going to start with a 1. All the way down to, there's a little less than a 5% chance that a number would start with a 9. So there's kind of some background. If you want to look more into it, Benford's Law is, it's really an amazing thing um, that um, like forensics detectives um, really look into and use to try to catch people who are potentially cheating at stuff. So what if we did not know the probability of the first number being a 9? What if we knew all of the other probabilities, right? What if we knew all 1 through 8's probabilities, but for whatever reason, we didn't know what 9 was. How could we figure out what the probability of 9 is? And so we might try to use some of those basic probability rules, right? Now, the, the first rule that every probability must be between 0 and 1, that's not really going to help us figure out this one individual probability. All we know is that the probability is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1, right? So we're going to use that second rule to help us figure out this probability. So that second rule said that the sum of all of the probabilities has to be 1. And so what if we added up all of these probabilities and we subtracted it away from 100%, right? So if we add all of these up here, um, I'm trying to remember what 9 was. I think it was 4.6%. So all of these should add up to be 0.9, or, you know, if I do this as a proportion instead of a percentage here. So here, let's rewrite it that way. Let's take all these, and we're going to say, we know we're going to get to 100%, but all of these add up to be 
95.4% uh, is what they should add up to be. And if I subtract all of those away, then that leaves me with a measly 4.6%, which must represent this probability of a 9. All right, so if you know all of the probabilities, but you're missing one, then you can always subtract away all of the probabilities that you do know from 100% to figure out what's left over. All right, next question, still dealing with Binford's Law. What is the probability that the first number is at least a 3? Well, what does at least a 3 mean here? It means we're going to start at 3, and it could start with a 4, or a 5, or a 6, or a 7, or an 8, or a 9. Well, what could we do with all of those probabilities? Well, we can simply just add them all together to get at least a 3. And this will be something we'll get a little bit more in-depth in in some future videos. Uh, but if I add all of those up, uh, that's going to give me the probability of at least a 3. And that should come out to be, hmm, let me think here, 52.3%. Uh, Fifty two point three percent of getting at least a three. Now some of you may be questioning and going, could we have done this a, a maybe in a different way that potentially was going to be easier? And I would say hold on to that thought for a second. Hold on. Because now we're going to talk about something called the complement rule. And we're going to use this pretty frequently off and on uh, in this chapter and the next chapter. And so the complement rule says if you want to find the probability of any event, then what you need to do is take one minus the probability of all of the other events. So this was like when we found the probability of a nine, right? We took one minus the probability of basically not a nine, which was one through eight. Uh, can we apply this to that same problem that we just did? And we can. Now, uh, notation wise, this is what the complement rule looks like. Okay, so we're going to say the probability of A, where A just represents an event, uh, is equal to 1 minus the probability of... Now, if you want to say everything that's not A, then it makes it look like that we're raising A to the C power. It kind of looks like an exponent. Uh, but that C you read as complement, which basically means not that. Okay, so we want the probability of A is 1 minus the probability of not A happening. So let's redo the last problem that we just did, but let's use the complement rule, right? So if I want to find the probability of getting at least, at least a 3, then I could take 1 minus the probability of not at least a 3. Well, what numbers is not at least a 3? Well, that would only represent two numbers, right? Getting a 1 or a 2. So if I took 1 minus uh, 0 0.301 and also subtracted away the 17.6%, that should also leave me with 52.3%. Okay, so we can use the complement rule. And to me, I like using the complement rule uh, whenever I need to find the probability of something, and if there's more things that I don't want than what I do want, then I'll use the complement rule. Now, I'm going to do one other little thing here. When I did that, when I said the probability of at least a 3, I could have written it more like this. The probability at least 3, and then complement which I wrote out what that meant specifically, right? Like, not at least a 3. But if you want to put that little C up there, you could. And we'll definitely use that notation more so as we get through uh, further on in this chapter. All right, so I'm going to leave you guys with this final question. It says, calculate the probability of randomly selecting a person that is or has been married at some point in their life. So I gave you this nice pie graph here. Uh, and we've got uh, four statuses. We have widowed, we have married, we have divorced, and we have never married. So for those that don't know maybe what widowed means, widowed means that you were married, but your spouse passed away. 
All right. So that is your problem to figure out. What is the probability that a person is or has been married at some point in their life? And there are a couple different ways to do this uh, using some of the things that we talked about in this video. And we'll talk about this the next day. Good luck.